Auspicious greetings to all viewers around the world. Welcome back to another episode of Fo Guangshan English Dharma Services. In this episode, we will continue from last week's discussion on the six perfections. Let's refresh our memories of last week's episode. First, we discussed four questions, and they are What is a Bodhisattva? Who can be a Bodhisattva? How to be a Bodhisattva? And what do Bodhisattva practice? We also talked about the first of the six perfections, which is the perfection of generosity, as well as the three ways we can practice generosity, and they are giving of wealth, giving of dharma, and giving of fearlessness. For today's episode, we will be talking about the perfections of precept. Patience and diligence. Upon hearing the word precept, what comes to your mind? Is it rules, restrictions, or limitations on your actions? On the surface, it may seem that precepts are restrictions on our actions. If our actions are restricted, how can we, as bodhisattvas, actively help other people? Let us first take a look at one of the fundamental precepts that Bodhisattvas uphold the Ten Wholesome Deeds. The Ten Wholesome Deeds are abstain from killing, abstain from stealing, abstain from sexual misconduct, abstain from lying, abstain from slanderous speech, abstain from harsh speech, abstain from idle chatter, and having no greed, having no anger. And having no deviant views. Perhaps you might be turned away from the ten wholesome deeds upon the first glance, because it looks like a things, a list of things that we cannot do. So why don't we break down the ten wholesome deeds into three parts? Each of the ten deeds correspond to one of the three karmas. The first three are related to our physical karma. The next four are related to our verbal karma, and the last three are related to our mental karma. The first three of the ten wholesome deeds are three of the fundamental precepts of Buddhism. The Buddhist five precepts also start with these three. Let's take a look at the first deed. Abstain from killing means not to harm the lives of any being, but that's not all to this precept. Except for not harming the lives of other beings, we should also be respectful to every life. Every life is precious, no matter if it is an ant, a frog, a dog, or even a shark, and especially the lives of all human beings. Every life should be respected and taken care of. If we could do this, then we are also becoming a more kind and compassionate person. What about abstaining from stealing? Stealing is an act of taking something that does not belong to us without permission from the owner. By abstaining from stealing, we are actually respecting people's possessions and properties. In this way, we will slowly earn a respectable reputation. Sexual misconduct means having an intimate relationship with people that is not your spouse or partner. In other words, extramarital affairs. By abstaining from sexual misconduct, we are not violating the body, reputation, or family of other people. More importantly. We respect everyone around us and their family. If we could abstain from sexual misconduct, then naturally we will also enjoy a harmonious and joyful relationship with our family members. The next four of the ten wholesome deeds are related to our verbal karma. First, we have abstain from lying. This is also the fourth of the five precepts. Abstaining from lying isn't just about not speaking words that are untrue, 
but it is also a reminder to speak truthfully. Abstain from slanderous speech means not to talk in a two-faced manner that ruin people's relationships. For example, Tina and Sophie are best friends, but one day their colleague Jenny told Tina that Sophie is the one who stole her lunch every day, and then went on and told Sophie that Tina was the one who dented her car. Because of Jenny's words. The two friends argued and turned against each other. The way Jenny talks is slanderous speech, with the intention of ruining people's relationships. The intention of our speech is also very important, and it should come from a sincere mind. Sometimes the words that come out of our mouth are harsh and cruel, intending to hurt the other person. This is why we should abstain from harsh speech, and not to say or scold others with vicious words. Abstaining from harsh speech is also a reminder for us to speak kindly. What about abstaining from idle chatter? Eminent masters of the past would not take a single step unless they are going to propagate the Dharma. Or say a single word unless it is the teaching of the Buddha. Sometimes, we find ourselves chattering away with our friends or family about something that we will forget right after the words leave our mouth. But for some people, everything that they say seems to carry a weight because of the meaning that they are conveying. Therefore, abstaining from idle chatter is not only a reminder for us. To say things that are meaningful, but also be aware that words have power. Speaking is the most important way we communicate with other people, and it is very easy for us to let our tongue get the better of ourselves. And this is why the ten wholesome deeds remind us to speak truthfully, sincerely, kindly, and meaningfully to others. So that our words brings comfort and encouragement instead of harm and injury. The final three of the ten wholesome deeds concerns our mental activities. The first is to have no greed. In Buddhism, greed, hatred, and ignorance are known as the three poisons, which is the root of our afflictions and troubles. When we have no greed. We are not attached to the people and things around us. Moreover, we are content with what we have. As we slowly lessen our greed, we find that we become a more generous person. With anger comes the intention to harm, whether verbally or physically. When we have no anger, we have no inclination to harm any being. Naturally, we will have kindness for everyone. And we are becoming a more compassionate practitioner. Last but not least of the ten wholesome deeds is to have no deviant views. In other words, we need to have right view. Having right view about the law of cause and effect, and of what is wholesome and unwholesome, so that we know how to conduct our physical, verbal, and mental karmas in a righteous and wholesome way. When our actions are guided with right views, naturally we will become righteous people. As we can see from the description above, precepts are not restrictions. In fact, precepts are our guide. For example, the ten wholesome deeds are the basic guidelines for all bodhisattvas, because it helps us to understand that our actions bring consequences. When we understand how our action may affect both ourselves and others, we will know better how to conduct ourselves so that both we and other people are also benefited. This is why the ten wholesome deeds is the foundation of all good conduct. As Venerable Master Xingyun said in Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple. Precepts are like a teacher that guides one through what should and should not be done. 
Precepts are like a rampart, keeping one safe. Precepts are like a virtuous book, increasing one's virtues so that others feel comfortable in one company. Precepts are akin to the foundations in building a palace. Without the protection of precepts, the twists and turns of life will be hard to tolerate. There is no need to fear the precept. Instead, uphold them as carefully as if protecting your eyes. The true meaning of upholding the precepts starts from not violating others onto elevating and protecting all sentient beings. Next, let us talk about the perfection of patience. But before I go into the details, let's take a moment and imagine this. As you learn more and more about Buddhism, you are inspired by the great bodhisattvas and vow to be a bodhisattva that can liberate both yourself and other sentient beings. You are ready to do whatever it takes to help people, no matter if it is giving away your possessions or spending your time and effort for a wholesome cause. But as you take your first step as a new bodhisattva, you find that sometimes your efforts are not appreciated by other people. Some people actually scorned at your act of giving or kindness. If this happens to you, what will you do? Will you still continue on a path as a bodhisattva? This is where the perfection of patience comes in. There are three kinds of patience, namely tolerating hateful insults and harm, calmly tolerating suffering of all kinds, and patience to observe the Buddha Dharma carefully. First, let's take a look at tolerating hateful insults and harm. No matter what we do in life, whether in our respective careers or on our path to be a bodhisattva practitioner, we might face physical or mental harm. The first kind of patience is to tolerate hateful insults and harms that come our way. When someone hurt us with harmful or even violent intentions, we practice compassion, knowing that these people are driven by their afflictions and influenced by unwholesome forces such as their greed, hatred, or ignorance. Master Xuanzang is one of the greatest Chinese Buddhist masters and translators. At the age of 27, he decided to travel to India to search for original Buddhist sutras that can resolve his doubts that he found in different schools of Buddhist teachings. At the very beginning of his 10,000 mile travel, he acquired a guide that can help him to cross the desert. But just the night before their journey into the great desert, this guide has a change of mind. He unsheathed his knife and advanced closer to Xuanzang. Perhaps he wanted to kill Master Xuanzang since they're traveling illegally. Perhaps he wanted to capture Xuanzang and send him to the guards in hope to get some repayment. When Master Xuanzang saw the guide's movement, instead of confronting him, Master Xuanzang meditated and recited the name of Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva. And on the next day, the guide parted ways with Master Xuanzang amicably. Despite facing a person that almost murdered him, Master Xuanzang remained calm and patient because he understood that this guard was also troubled by the external circumstances. In the end, no one was hurt. The second kind of patience that we can practice is to calmly tolerate sufferings of all kinds. Suffering comes in many forms, for example, the weather or temperature, or animals such as mosquitoes or scorpions. But more importantly, when we choose to be a bodhisattva practitioner, we are faced with the sufferings that 
our cultivation brings. Let's go back to the story of Master Xuanzang. After he left China for India, it was actually a very tumultuous time in China, as there was a shift in the country's ruling power. The government decreed that no one can leave the land of China, so Master Xuanzang actually left the country illegally. To get to India, Master Xuanzang had to cross Great Desert and climb over snowy mountains, all alone except for an old horse as his guide. Once, he accidentally spilled his water skin in the middle of the desert and almost died of thirst. Despite this phys physical adversity and mental pressure, Xuanzang said, I vow to keep on traveling west, even if it leads to my death, then taking a step back to the east, even if I will leave. Master Xuanzang put his physical and mental sufferings aside, and he was undeterred by the harsh external conditions during his travels. This is why he could reach India successfully with nothing but his two feet and a powerful vow to seek the Dharma. Last but not least is the patience to observe the Buddha Dharma carefully. Patience is indeed easier said than done, especially when we are hurt by others. Therefore, we need the Buddha Dharma to help increase our patience. When we observe that all phenomena arise and cease according to causes and conditions, we find it easier to stay calm and be unaffected by the phenomena around us, because we know that what is good will come to past, but what is bad will also come to past. When Master Xuanzang returned to China after 16 years of traveling and studying in India, he began to translate the Buddhist text that he brought back. One day, he saw a young man who had the intelligence and the potential to assist him in his translation project and asked if the young man would like to renounce and be his disciple. Of course, the young man has no inclination of becoming a monk, but he finally conceded under three conditions. The young man asked to have three parts of books, wine, and ladies to go with him wherever he went, as he couldn't live without any of them. Though it is inappropriate for a monk to have wine and wife, Master Xuanzang agreed. He understood that this is a process the young man has to go through, and indeed, after becoming a monastic, and after studying the sutras and helping with Master Xuanzang's translation, the young man realized that there is no more joy in his wine and wife, and there is actually more joy that the Dharma could offer him. He then truly renounced both physically and mentally as a monastic and became Master Kui Ji, which is Master Xuanzang's greatest disciple. As Venerable Master Xing Yun said in Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple, patience is neither passively compromising nor holding in one's anger. It is kind and compassionate tolerance for others. Those who practice patience and compassion truly understand that all are one and equal. Just like Master Xuanzang, with his great patience, he could travel across unimaginable distance under extreme conditions. With his great patience, Master Xuanzang saw potential in a young man and patiently helped him to find his way in the Dharma. And it is because of his great patience that Master Xuanzang became one of the greatest masters in Buddhist history. One day, a disciple by the name of Aniruddha accidentally dozed off when he was listening to the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha reprimanded him with a verse, Pity, for your love of sleeping, you are like a clam, sleeping for a thousand years without 
ever hearing the name of the Buddha. Aniruddha was very ashamed of himself, and he said, "Please forgive my laziness. From today on, I vow never to sleep, and instead practice diligently." The Buddha was very glad to see that Aniruddha was willing to change himself for the better, but he also advised. Cultivation cannot be accomplished if we work too hard or too little. You must cultivate accordingly. However, Aniruddha held firm to his vow, and he would not rest even for a minute. In just a few days, his body could not handle it, and his eyes started to hurt. Even though the Buddha advised him again to practice and rest accordingly, Aniruddha refused to listen. Soon enough, Aniruddha went blind from overexertion. Is this what diligence is about in Buddhism? Does it mean that we have to practice tirelessly until our physical body gives out, so that we can perfect the cultivation of diligence? This is not right diligence. According to the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha taught us four kinds of right effort, and they are. To prevent unwholesome states that have not yet arisen, to end unwholesome states that have already arisen, to develop wholesome states that have not yet arisen, and to strengthen wholesome states that have already arisen. And as Venerable Master Xingyun elaborated in Buddha Dharma Pure and Simple. For unwholesome deeds and thoughts that had yet to arise, prevent them by using our wisdom. And for unwholesome deeds that are already committed, we should repent them bravely and end them. As for wholesome deeds and thoughts that has yet to arise, we should develop them with courage and motivation. And for wholesome actions and thoughts that. Are already existing. We should protect them so that they are enhanced. In short, we should be hardworking and diligent in preventing the unwholesome and cultivating the wholesome. We cannot afford even a moment of laziness or indolence. Going back to the story of Aniruddha, after he became blind. Although he still continued practicing, he had trouble participating in the everyday activities with the rest of the sangha, and sometimes he couldn't even manage his own things. For example, he couldn't patch up his robes even when they are torn. So Aniruddha had no choice but to request help from another monk. When the Buddha heard of this incident, he went to Aniruddha. And helped him to sew his robes. Furthermore, the Buddha also taught Aniruddha the right way to be diligent. Soon after, under the guidance of the Buddha, Aniruddha attained the supernatural power of the divine eye that enabled him to see not just things around him, but also all the Dharma realms. Diligence is an indispensable practice in the sixth perfection, for this is the attitude we need to have in practicing the Bodhisattva path. In other words, we need to practice the perfections of generosity, precept, patience, meditative concentration, and prajna wisdom diligently. With diligence, we can perfect our merit and wisdom. Furthermore, diligence is like the tortoise in the fable of the tortoise and the hare. Sprinting towards the ultimate goal will only burn us out before we reach it, and we might even lose faith and confidence in the process of our practice. This is why we need to be like the tortoise. Our pace may be a little slow, but we take each step resolutely and make no stop. Until we reach the ultimate goal. Before we end today's session, let's recap what we've discussed today. For the perfection of precept, we talked about the ten wholesome deeds, which are 
Abstain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, slanderous speech, harsh speech, idle chatter, and to have no greed, no anger, and no deviant views. For the perfection of patience, we talked about practicing patience with three steps, which are tolerating hateful insults and harms, calmly tolerating sufferings of all kinds, and patience to observe the Buddha Dharma carefully. And for the perfection of diligence, we talked about to prevent unwholesome states that have not yet arisen, to end unwholesome states that have already arisen, to develop wholesome states that have not yet arisen, and to strengthen wholesome states that have already arisen. Thank you for listening to this episode. Next week, we will be discussing the perfections of meditative concentration and prajna wisdom. May you find joy and inspiration in this Dharma talk. Omitofo.